Okay. Back. Everyone had a great weekend. Now I sound a little too loud. All right. Hopefully that's sufficient. All right. So today we're going to, um, you know, one of the themes of the past week or so has been us continually expanding our ability to work with more kinds of data. We started out by looking at single data values. Then we looked at ways to work with arrays of those values, multiple of, you know, uh, values of a particular type. And then we looked at strings, a particularly interesting and useful and, you know, uh, meaningful type of data that Java has some actual built-in support for. That was our first introduction to objects last week. And today we're going to talk about multi-dimensional arrays. Uh, this allows us to work with data that has higher dimensionality than just a single series of values. And this turns out to be most data in the world around us. It, it takes this form. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about sort of, you know, how the next couple of weeks are going to work. Um, we have a couple of unusual things coming up that I just want to kind of prepare you for, get a sense of how to budget your time and the type of how, kind of how things are going to proceed for the next couple of weeks. So... The, the early deadline in MP0, so that was, that passed. It looks like people are doing great. I just checked the scores on MP0. It looks like a lot of people, like, just blew past the early deadline and decided to finish, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I can still see there's a group of you, maybe some people on the orange team that are waiting it out um, to get started. But please, you know, if you are on the orange team, take advantage of the office hours today from 12 to 8 p.m. Uh, we have lots of staff down there. Um, I haven't talked to the staff yet about how the weekend went, but it seems like you guys are making great progress so far. All right, so this is kind of how things are going to go for the next couple months, right? Um, you know, some of the checkpoints are a little easier than others, some are a little harder than others, but, you know, start getting into a rhythm of allocating time for the class, coming to office hours so that you can work there and be surrounded by people that are doing the same thing and that can help you or can assist you, can guide you, um, and you're going to do great. You guys are, are going to succeed in this class. This is sort of how we do things. Um, MP0 is due next weekend. Uh, we're going to come around to the lab tomorrow, kind of check on people, make sure everybody is off to a good start on MP0, maybe sure, make sure everyone figured out how to submit MP0. This is a common source of mistakes and errors that will help you guys iron out on this first round. Um, next week is also the first midterm for the class. Now let me remind you what the word midterm in this course means. A midterm in this class is a quiz, but it's a quiz that you can't drop. However, when you look at your overall grade, each one of our three midterms turns out to actually be worth a little bit less than the quizzes, because you can drop some of the quizzes. So the midterm's a little bit more cumulative. Um, they're gonna push you a little, they're a little bit more heavily weighted towards the small programming problems as opposed to the multiple choice questions. Um, so, kind of, we're wrapping up the first unit in the class on imperative programming this week. So, between today, uh, Wednesday, and then Friday, when we'll do some, just some midterm review in class, that's really kind of designed to help you get ready for that first midterm. Yeah, question? No. There are no questions on coders on the midterm. Um, they will resume after the midterm. Uh, that's on the calendar, too. I just added that yesterday. Okay, so our goal this week, and to be honest, MP0 is a great way to prepare for the imperative programming midterm, because a lot of the same things you're doing in MP0 are a great way to practice, as is working on the old homework problems, things like that, right? So we want to deliver you into the CBTF next week with the best possible chance of success. We'll do some midterm review in class. Um, this week's lab is a helpful preparation for the midterm, so, you know, we really are, we're not pausing everything, you guys still have the MP to work on, but again, the MP tasks are a really good fit um, with getting you ready for the midterm. Next week, during midterm week, what we do is we start talking about object-oriented programming, which is the next unit of the class, we'll start that on Monday, and we'll be doing some simple homework problems on object-oriented programming during the midterm. These are not hard, they are super, like, two or three lines of code each, so, you know, these are just warm-ups. Um, they shouldn't interfere with your preparation for the midterm. These are, you know, some of the homework problems you guys have been doing now are a little tougher, right? Um, and, and that's how the class sort of works, right? So kind of throughout the three units in the class, what you'll notice is that when we start something new, things are a little bit easier for a week or two, and then we kind of ramp up. So we're kind of at the trickiest part of the first 
um, the most difficult part of the first part of the class. Um, once you guys um, get through the midterm next week, we'll be talking about objects, which are conceptually a little bit more complicated, but the first couple homework problems are not, okay? All right, any questions about sort of next week going forward? Yeah. The midterm's in the CBTF, it's just another quiz. So you sign up for it, take it the same way you guys are used to for the last couple quizzes. You go on the scheduler, pick a time, show up. Now again, keep in mind, you cannot drop the midterm, right? So in the past, if you forgot to show up at the CBTF or you know, whatever, then we, that was okay, you could drop some of those quiz scores. You cannot drop the midterm, you have to take it. Okay, um, I'm also not going to hold it for like two weeks so that people can take it, right? So you really need to take it next week. If that's a problem, let me know. Uh, but that's, that's really what we need you guys to do. Other questions? Okay, good. So let's talk about arrays. So when we, when we first met arrays, we talked about single dimensional arrays. We talked about how to allocate them, how to initialize them, how to work with them using loops and other data structures and other sort of programming methods. I can allocate arrays with multiple dimensions. Now, I, I do want to be, uh, be fair about this, which is that, and sort of um, maybe calm any fears here, which is in the, in the past, we used to do a programming assignment that really, really stressed working with multi-dimensional arrays. We don't do that anymore, okay? So this part of the class has been de-emphasized a little bit, which I think is fine, right? Uh, you'll do a few homework problems this week on multidimensional arrays. They may come up on one of the MP checkpoints, but we don't really have a heavy focus on this anymore, right? Um, but I wanted to show you this partly because it really expands the kind of data that you can work with. All right, so we looked at how to allocate multidimensional arrays. So on line two, what I'm doing is I'm saying, Java, I want to declare an array called samples. I know it's an array because of the uh, brackets here. This is an array of integers. Um, and then I initialize it over here on the right side to be, have initial size of four, right? And I shouldn't say initial size, to have size of four. In Java, arrays cannot change size. Here, I'm initializing now a two-dimensional array. So you'll see two pairs of square brackets on the left, um, and then a very similar syntax on the right. Now, I have two dimensions of the array to initialize. So I tell Java, I want an array with size four in the first dimension and size eight in the second dimension. On the bottom, and I can just sort of continue this on ad infinitum, right? So here's a three-dimensional array of doubles, um, and this three-dimensional array has size six in the first dimension, eight in the second dimension, and 10 in the third dimension, right? Um, arrays in Java have to have a single type. That kind of makes sense. Every data value inside that array um, is the same kind. You know, I don't, do I want to talk about this? So, so internally what Java actually does is Java multidimensional arrays are arrays of arrays. So, and this is not something that, you know, you're going to need to know, but I just wanted to show you how this works. If I create a two-dimensional array here, right, this is a two-dimensional array with size four in the first dimension, size eight in the, in the second dimension that holds integers. Now, what I'm doing on line five may look kind of interesting, which is that I'm declaring a one-dimensional array called sample slice. This is sometimes referred to, referred to as taking an array slice. That is the, the first, it's essentially the first subarray inside samples. So what will samples, what size will sample slice have? If samples is size four in the first dimension and eight in the second dimension, and I'm taking one of the subarrays, there are four subarrays inside samples, then sample slice has size eight, and the size in the second dimension. So there are four slices I could take. I could take sample zero, samples one, samples two, samples three. Each one of those is a one-dimensional array containing eight elements. This is how these work internally, right? And let's just, um, let's prove that to ourselves by putting some logging in here and looking at sample slice dot length, which turns out to be eight. And again, I, I have four of these that I can take. If I try to take one, the fifth one, I'm gonna get a problem. I have a problem, right? Each one of these slices acts exactly like a single dimensional array of ints that would store eight values. So here, what I can do is I can take the, the 
fourth slice, and then I can do samples slice seven is equal to some integer value, let's say 10, right? And that'll work fine. If I try to go outside that bounds, I have the same problem, right? The length of that slice is eight. Okay. We can initialize multidimensional arrays in, in using a variant of the static initializer syntax we saw with regular arrays. This is, this is pretty terrible to read, uh, and I wouldn't advise you, know, you guys really doing this, right? It's much more common to create an empty array that you're gonna use to store some data and then load the data into it from some other place rather than doing something like this, right? This up here is the equivalent to taking a multidimensional array. This is in a multidimensional array of integers that has size two in the first dimension and size two in the second dimension and then setting each element of that explicitly. Notice here that like my single dimensional arrays, with a multidimensional array, I use two pairs of brackets to access each element, right? Um, sort of, you know, you think about it in terms of position. In order to figure out what the position of the item is in the array, I now have to provide two coordinates, or three if it was a three-dimensional array, or four if it was a four-dimensional array. Another way to think about it that's equally important is that now, remember when we talked about arrays, we said each value that I put inside the array, I'm associating metadata with it. That metadata is the index, right? Now, you can kind of see from this example, here's my data that's being stored in the array. Each piece of data now has two pieces of metadata. It's position in the first dimension and it's position in the second dimension, right? What those values mean is totally up to you. And I actually, I wanna, I'm gonna have my little rant about this that all my former students have heard in a minute, okay? But there are two words that I have not said today in class, and I will try to always avoid talking about when we talk about arrays. Does anyone know what they are? Two little words. Well, one of them is like medium size, the other one's a little. Two little words that will dramatically affect your understanding of this, yeah. Row and column. How many people want to talk about the two-dimensional array like this, as having two rows and two columns? That's okay if you do, that's fine. Some of you. Some of your minds were polluted in high school by some well-meaning person, or maybe, maybe you've used too many spreadsheets or something, okay? But we don't talk about rows and columns when we talk about multidimensional arrays. I don't care how many dimensions they have, and even if it's two, right? The reason is the meaning of this metadata is totally up to you. You can use a two-dimensional array to store data that doesn't have any notion of a row and column, okay? And then once you get to three or four or five dimensional arrays, what are you even talking about, right? Three dimensional array doesn't have rows and columns. It's now in space. A four dimensional array can't even visualize. It's got too many dimensions for me to even, um, you, know, you know, project it into space, right? So it's not how we're gonna think about this. We're gonna think about each value in the array having two pieces of metadata associated with it and us, the programmer, being in charge of what that means. Right, what that means in our program. Sometimes, with two-dimensional arrays, we are talking about position. So, you know, in the example that we had on the cover slide, we were talking about a board, a tic-tac-toe board. The position of each piece on the board is stored in a two-dimensional array. So there's a mapping between the two-dimensional array and space. But that's not always the case. In fact, we'll come back and talk about a different use of these coordinates in a minute. All right. So, and, you know, again, you guys can kind of mess around with the, oh, it's, it's mad about there not being a, what else is it mad about? Oh, I need, yeah, that's a terrible example. All right, let's, let's just do this like this, because Chuck is gonna kill me. How about that? Okay, so now it wants, it wants white space there. There we go, all right. Sorry, I'll fix that on the slide later. Um, so here, I'm pulling the, the, f the first value, I'm, 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 I'm essentially retrieving the value that's in the first position in the first array and the first position in the second array. Now I can retrieve the value that's in the first position in the first array and the second position in the second. All right, any questions about this syntax, notation, yeah? Internally, that's actually what it is. I typically call it first dimension, second dimension, right? The terminology, actually you should choose in a way that's appropriate to the problem that you're solving, right? So there are times, like let's say you were storing a spreadsheet 
in here. Then you could use the words rows and columns because a spreadsheet has rows and columns. But if you're storing like audio data in there, then row and column makes no sense, right? So choose ways of talking about arrays that are appropriate to the problem, right? All right, sorry. So here's my little mini ranty slide. So we already did that. And again, as a programmer, you're in charge of what these mean, and you should also pick names for them that are appropriate to the problem you're working on, right? So again, if you're designing a system to store information about, you know, uh, uh, geospace data, right? So you guys have been working with that in MP0, we talk about Latin long. You can store latitude longitude data in a two-dimensional array, but you wouldn't call it rows and columns. You would say the first dimension is latitude, the second dimension is longitude, if I, if I grid it. All right, so we've talked already about a couple of different kinds of data that we can store this way. And it turns out, again, there's a lot of data out there in the world that's pretty amenable to being stored in a multidimensional array, right? I, like, I, I got to the slide and I was like, what was I, what, would, what did I mean to say here, right? Like, what is this, but this is a photograph, right? That's what I meant to say, right? It doesn't even matter what it's of, right? This is a picture. So photo data, right? The data that you guys share on Facebook, on Snapchat, or whatever, any type of picture consists of data that we can store and manipulate in a two-dimensional array. The data is the value at each pixel. So the color associated with, so essentially how photographs work, if you don't already know this, and you probably have figured this out already, is that I take, um, I take, uh, you know, the light that's coming in, and I break it into tiny, tiny little pieces called a pixel. Each one of these is a tiny little square. If I make them small enough, they blend in together, and you start to see something that looks like a photograph. But every value on this screen, somewhere in my computer's memory, is stored as a single number that represents the different components of the color, how much red it has, how much green it has, how much blue it has. Right? When I make the pixels small enough, Again, your eye perceives them as looking like the actual, the actual image, right? So internally, this is, you know, stored in some two-dimensional array that probably has something like a thousand, um, a, a thousand pixels in the first dimension and maybe size 800 in the second dimension. And so it's got lots and lots and lots of values. So if I go across, in order to project this on the screen, the projector needs to know for every position on the screen, what color light should I be shining there, right? Okay, so any type of photographic data. Right? A lot of scientific data that we work with. So how many dimensions does this data have? Anyone wanna tell me? Yeah. I hear three, anybody wanna go more? Four. Yeah, because I've got color on here too, right? So this is one way of representing four-dimensional data, right? Is that I plot it in three dimensions, right? Which jumps out of the plot. And then I use color or some other way to represent a fourth dimension. So this is one way of collapsing. Whenever you have higher dimensionality data, like four or five dimensionality data, you have to find some way to collapse it onto a plot. And so here what the authors of this plot have done is that they've chosen to represent one of the dimensions of the data with color. But again, let's think about it. So each piece of data here, right, has four numbers associated with it. It has its position on this plot, and then it also has this, um, this value, all right? Okay, what about this guy? What type of data are we talking about here? It's supposed to be suggestive. I feel like every year I do this and I'm always surprised by the fact that people don't seem to know this. So um, most of you have how many ears? Two. There's actually, if you go on my YouTube channel, there's actually a comment from somebody watching this video like two semesters ago. It's like, I was offended by this because I only have one ear and I didn't feel included by this example. So a lot of us have two ears, right? If we have two ears, then when you listen to music, is the same Data going in both ears? No. When, you, when music is recorded, eventually it is mixed down to two separate tracks, at least two, 
two even for the crappy stuff you guys listen to streaming over the internet to your cheap Bluetooth headsets, right? One for the right ear, one for the left ear. That's actually incredibly important. Has anyone ever tried listening to like mono music before? Same thing in both ears? It turns out that the ability to change what's entering each one of your ears plays a huge role in how sound engineering is done. By modifying the signal that's entering both ears, I can make it sound like the drummer is over there or behind you, or it really affects the, um, the, your listening experience, right? And people, you know, people go and get entire degrees about how to do this, right? Sound engineering. It's basically how to take an entire sound experience produced by like a big band or something like that and collapse it into two different sets of data. One for your right ear, one for your left. Now, if you go to like a movie theater, you might have noticed that they have like eight tracks. So there's one signal that's being sent out by the speaker underneath the stage. There's two speakers flanking the uh, screen. There's speakers running down the sidewalls. There's a subwoofer in the back. So this is, you know, one of the things that makes, you know, if you like going to a movie theater, you might think, well, what about the movie theater am I not getting at home? You might have a really nice stereo system at home, but the movie theater probably has a nicer stereo system. So that's one of the ways that it sort of improves the experience. So again, let me go back to the row and column thing here. Data, so data that is being fed into your ears is inherently two-dimensional, right? One dimension is the ear, right or left. The second dimension is time, and the data is the air pressure measurements that are stored in the sound file, right? So it doesn't make any sense to talk about this in terms of rows and columns. You could talk about it in terms of channel and time, right? The channel is right or left, or front, back, side, rear, center, whatever, and time are as they, uh, you know, measures the actual time at which that sample is recorded, right? So, okay, so we went, we went over all this, that's good. Now, when we work with data in a single dimensional array, we frequently use a loop to access all that data and then do something to it. When we use data in multidimensional arrays, we frequently use what's called a nested loop. So again, they're frequently timed. So, you know, how many people like use some sort of photo modification software on your phone, right? You all do this, don't lie, right? You take a photo and there's some button, it's like make it look really good, right? And then you hit that button and then that's the thing you do before you send it off to be shared. What do you think that does? It goes through all of the data in that photo. It goes through every pixel, and it performs some type of magical transformation on it that makes you look thinner and makes it look like you're having more fun, that the sun was brighter, and that the, you know how to use a camera, right? Like, that's, that's the goal. Um, that's done by processing the data inside that array that's storing the information about the photo, right? And this is how we get all that data out one piece at a time. So what does this look like? I have an array, I have a loop, my outer loop. My outer loop is going through all of the indices in the first dimension of my multi-dimensional multi multiple dimensional array. Multi-dimensional array, there we go. And then my inner loop is going through all the indices. So remember, array i in a multi-dimensional array and a two-dimensional array is a one-dimensional array. So now I'm going through all the indices of each inner second level array, and then finally when I get down here, if array is two-dimensional, I have coordinates i, j, then I'm gonna to use to look up a value in that array. And then I can print it off. So, so again, let's, well, for now, let me see if I, first of all, let's see if we can, check style is gonna kill us here, right? No, we're not doing too bad, okay. So let's, let's play with this a little bit. Okay, so my example today is a game called Tic-Tac-Toe. I realize not everybody may be familiar with Tic-Tac-Toe. Okay, so Tic-Tac-Toe is a game that's played on a three by three board. Players take turns. The goal, is one player uh, places O's on the board, the other player places X's on the board. And the goal is to get three X's or O's in a row, either in a column um, or a row or diagonally, right? Now here, I think we can use column and rows because we're talking about a board, right? So that's fine. Now, let's write a little program to check to see if somebody won the game. This is a good chance for us to not only uh, get some practice with working with two-dimensional arrays, but also solve a little algorithmic problem. But the first thing I'm gonna suggest that we do 
like we approach a lot of these problems, is just figure out how to get out all the data. So let's just write a loop to go through this entire two-dimensional array, just print off the values. All right, that's the first thing I'm gonna do in this function, all right? So the argument to my function is a two-dimensional array that I can call board. I, that, this function gets a single argument. I can get rid of this static now. I gotta go back and fix these examples. All right. So I have an array called board, and let's just iterate through that. Again, this is a new type of for loop for us to write. Um, that's another one that you will get used to writing soon. So let's, let's write the outer loop first, and let's just print off the indices. And I'm just gonna return a blank character for now so that this will stop, okay. So now I can see that the first dimension of board has size three. I go through valid indices zero, one, and two. Now let's print off, just so that we convince ourselves of this, we're gonna print board i dot length because board i is the subarray at this position and, nope, oh, I need a plus. And board i should also be an array, and sure enough it is, okay? So now I see that I have a valid index for one of the subarrays of board, and then that subarray size is three. So now, let's write a second for loop. j is gonna go through board i dot length, and then I'm gonna increment j. It's, it's traditional when working with multidimensional arrays. You know, you know, typically we talk about good variable naming uh, when we talk about writing our code. I and J are acceptable variable names when working with arrays. Are they descriptive? No. Are there better terms for them usually? Yes. Can you use them? Probably, people are used to it, right? I and J are kind of here to stay. And I don't know why people picked I and J anyway. They look so similar. It turns out to be kind of confusing, but anyway. Um, so let's print off the value at that point in the board. Okay. So this looks okay. Um, now, why don't we, well let's also print off i and j just so we can see what's happening here. I, all right, so I'm printing the first index, the second index, and the character at that position. Now for fun, let's see if we can print this off a little bit more nicely. So let's do this. Instead of printing a line with the character on it, I'm gonna print just the character, and then here I'm gonna do an empty printlet. So this is what this is gonna do. It's gonna print all the characters um, in each subarray in, in order, and then it's gonna skip a new line every time I get to a new top level. So now I get something that might look a little bit more like what you might show to a user if you were building a tic-tac-toe game on your phone. Any questions about this so far? Now, you might wonder, like, is the board, is it like, does it look right? And that's the point at which it's like, you're in charge, okay? So in this particular, um, this particular version of this, this is position zero, zero, right? And then this down here, I think, is position 2-2. Two, two. But that's up to you to design, right? If you want the board to have its bottom right corner be the position 0-0, zero, zero, then you can adjust this loop to get that to happen. Right? It, just, it just depends, right? Okay, so now what do we need to do? What's our algorithm for approaching this problem? So now we've kind of seen, use this as a chance to see how to get through um, a nested loop. So for now, let's only try to find winners in one of the dimensions, okay? Not in both, just in one. Who could walk me through how I would do that? It's my algorithm for determining. So the goal of this is to, of this function, it's essentially if somebody has won the game. So you can imagine every time a player takes a turn, I run this function. And if it detects that somebody has won, someone has played a winning move, it returns either X or O, and if it doesn't detect that, it returns this period character that indicates that the game is not over yet. 
That's also the character that we're using to hold blank spaces on the board. We could use a blank space as well, um, but the periods are easier to see. All right, somebody walk me through how, just in English, right? Again, and again, think about how, as a person, you would check a tic-tac-toe game to see if somebody won. Right? I give you a tic-tac-toe board. Many of you understand the rules to this game. What's the process you would go through to see if somebody had won? And then we'll think about how we can replicate that. Yeah. Well, somebody gave up. You guys know how to do this. Come on. I am not trusting my new niece to play tic-tac-toe with any of you, because clearly you guys don't know the rules. It's not, not a complicated game. Somebody, somebody help me out who hasn't spoken up in class before. You, know you guys know how to do this. Just talk me through it in English. Don't need to write the code yet. We need an idea of what we're going to do first, and then we'll work on getting the code to fit our sense of what needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah, so what am I looking for? That's a great way to start thinking about the problem. I'm looking for a series of X's or O's where, you know, they either span one of the rows or one of the columns. Or diagonal, but let's not worry about diagonal for now. We're just going to do a row or a column. So let's look at the output data here, right? And again, now, now let's try to think, we know what we're looking for. Let's try to think a little bit more systematically, kind of like a computer would approach this problem. Okay, so let's say I'm going to check the rows horizontally. So I start with the first one. What, what a player has played in the first position? X. Okay? So now I know that if X, it, the only way that there can be a winner in this row is if this row is all X's. So what has to be true? So the next character also has to be X, and the next character also has to be X. Right? So again, now, now let's try, try to think about the algorithm that I followed. So I looked at the character in the first column. And then I said, okay, in order for it to be a winner, it has to be the same as the character in the second column and the same as the character in the third column. Right? Let's try writing this down and see if this, see if this will help. Okay? So I'm, now I'm doing this for each one of my rows. And so this outer loop is going through the rows in the board. That's what we're going to call the, the second level arrays. So now I'm going to say if board 0 is equal to board 1, right? So the character in the first column has to be equal to the character in the second column, and board 0 is equal to board Two. Oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. I need to use my double indices. So I'm looking at this column. All right. Then I'm going to let's just let's just print this out. I'm going to print that character. So what am I what have I identified here? I've identified a place where I'm going to remove this inner loop for now. Okay, so right now it's not printing anything. But let's, let's test a couple of cases where we think that it should work, right? Okay, so my inner arrays are my rows. So here I created a row, but I've got three characters in a row that are all X's, so that seems to work. And actually, let's print both the location and the, the winner. So let's try something else. What about O's? Okay, that seems to work. Let's try a winner in the second row rather than the first. That also seems to work. All right, this seems promising. Can someone, there's a problem with this though. Can someone produce a board where this will inaccurately conclude that there is a winner or that there is not a winner? Yeah. 
Yeah, so what happens if nobody is played in the first row? Let's say that nobody is played in the first row, but there's a winner in the second row. My, my algorithm is going to do, unfortunately, it, it, now it's confused, right? So if I had returned there, it would have only found, it would have thought that the game hadn't ended. So what do I need to do to fix this? Pretty easy. Who can, who can help correct this bug in my algorithm? hasn't contributed yet today. Trust me, guys, I definitely have a degree in long pauses, so. Someone help me fix this. It's not hard. Or someone describe what I need to do to, to handle this particular case. Yeah. Yeah, so I, what I want to be able to do is figure out if nobody has played in that, um, or what, am I, what do I really want to check for? It's a simpler check than this. So I want to avoid a case where there's, the, the, the problem here is that the board, the, my, my algorithm is not distinguishing between this special character dot and the two characters that indicate that there's a, there's a, a space in, that there's actual game pieces in that row. So how can I fix this? Exactly. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say if board zero is equal to period. So if the first character, if the first piece, if the first space in that row is empty, can there be a winner in that row? No, because I need three pieces in a row. So if the first space is empty, and here's the place where I'm going to use my continue statement. So now my algorithm is saying if the first spot in the row is empty, then I know that I don't have to do any more work because there cannot be a winner in this row. Okay, so now I'm going to go down here and I'm going to, let's change this to return. Because now at this point, if I do find a place where the first character is equal to the second character and the first character is equal to the third character, I have found a winner and I should stop. All right, so now, if I get what I'm going to do down here, and this is a common pattern that you guys are going to start to see and use on some of the homework problems. So what is my code doing here? I'm looking for a row that satisfies a particular criteria. That's what I have embedded in this if statement on line 9. If I find one, I can return immediately. The game's over. Right? I found a winner. If I get all the way through the board, and I've checked every single row, and I didn't find a winner, then I'm going to return that nobody won. Now, is this correct? What have I not checked when I get to the bottom so far? I haven't checked the columns. Yeah, so I'm actually going to have, you guys are going to finish this as part of a homework problem. I need to go back and finish the job by looking through the columns as well. And that looks very similar to what we just did here. That's just slightly different. But let's make sure that this piece of code works. Okay, so, uh, uh oh. This is, uh, this is a problem. Oh, <laughs> no, it's not. I forgot to put the result. There we go. Outsmart myself sometimes. There we go. Okay. So in this case, it skipped over. Let's go. Let me pull this down a little bit. We don't need all this output. It skipped over the first row in which nobody had played, and it found a row, a winner in the second row. In this case, it should find a winner in the first row. And then in this case, let's make sure that it can find a winner in the last row as well. Oh, sorry, there's already a winner in the first row. Let me put a, okay. All right, so this, we've solved part of the problem. All right, we are handling looking in rows. And again, I will leave this as an exercise to the viewer for you to finish on the homework problem to find a way to look through the columns. You do not have to check diagonally, that's not that really that hard. 
So one of the things I want to point out about we, what we were just doing when we went through this is testing. Um, and this is not something that, you know, we ask you guys to, to uh, we don't ask you in this class to write tests, but I do want you to understand a little bit about why we test your code the way that we do and give you a head start in thinking about this as part of software development, right? So first question is, you know, what's a good way to write tests? Pick an input that you know the answer for. Feed that into your algorithm and make sure that it's doing the right thing, okay? There's a certain, um, th there's a certain sort of like diabolical nature that allows people to write tests well. When you're writing tests, you have to kind of think of yourself as your own adversary. You are trying to break your own code. Why? Because if you break it on a test and fix it, then it's better. Then it won't break in front of a client. Then it won't break, you know, during your interview, right? Then it won't break in front of a user and crash and, and make them sad, all right? So picking good test cases is a really indispensable part of this. You have to think, what are all the corner cases that could cause problems uh, for, my, for my program, right? And you pick those and make sure that the, the, the code works, right? Um, let me tell you another reason. That, you, that we write tests, okay? And this is something that I want you to think about as you're working on the MP. How many people have found working on the MP to be fairly frustrating? Okay, so that's normal. That is a part of your future life in programming and computer science. I wish I could say it wasn't so, but it is. One of the things we, we try to do in this field is find ways to cope with the, you know, some of you guys have been reading Encoders, he talks a lot about failure. That's one of my favorite things about this book. He talks about how central it is. And I think when I first read Coders, I was like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this my entire life and I've never really thought about this, but it's, a big, it's become a big part of who I am and it's something that I need to think about as well. Because life and technology is frequently an unending struggle with failure. Because as soon as you fix something and it stops failing, you forget about it immediately. Maybe if you're like me and I have like kind of like a goldfish-style brain, but um, you move on to the next thing. So why am I talking about this? Because my, my advice to you is to find little bits of encouragement and support along the way. You know what makes me feel good when I'm writing code? When one of my test cases passes. It really does. It's like a little burst of like positive endorphins or whatever, right? You see the little green checkbox? I find that exciting too. And do you, so, so do you know what I do to keep myself going when I have to write something that's really complicated? Is I write a lot of tests and I run them all the time. Sometimes I run them even if I know what the result's going to be. Because I get this little green checkbox and then it's like, I feel good. And that gives me a little bit of extra momentum to carry on. So what does that mean for you guys? Run the test cases a lot. We've given to them to you for a reason. You can run them one at a time. When you are working, the more code you write without running a test case, the more likely it's gonna be wrong. And as you run those test cases and you get them to pass one at a time, that will be a little bit of a boost, a little bit of positive energy and feedback for you that will help you carry on. Right? Again, maybe you guys think I'm nuts, but I've been doing this a long time and I've realized that one of the reasons that I write tests, and I do write tests, and I run them a lot, is because it helps. It helps keep you going, right? It's good, positive motivation. All right. Let's see here. I think I've, okay, I think I've run, oh, I wanna talk about string equality in a minute. Um, let's talk about this, because this is actually kind of important to know, right? We have one more little topic to wrap up. Um, so, we've been working with strings. We started doing that last time. And one of the things that can trip people up is how do I test if two strings are equal to each other in Java? Now here's the problem. We've been, Java allows us to work with strings as if they're sort of like primitive types. So I can assign a literal to them. But it turns out that things are, if I try to use the double equals for strings, things are going to get weird. Let me show you how, all right? So, 
I've got two strings on line one, two, and three. They have the same contents. Now, on five and six, I've created strings in that different way we talked about that uses the new keyword, but they still have the same contents. Can we agree about this? So, what I would like is I'd like that line four would print true, and I'd like that line seven would print true. Here's the problem. Doesn't happen. So I think that this is probably one of the most confusing things about Java, particularly if you're coming from a language like Python that doesn't have this problem, or JavaScript that also doesn't have this problem, or any other sane language that doesn't have this problem. But in Java, strings are objects. And if we want to compare two objects to each other, we need to use something, a method that all objects have. That's called dot equals. You can test object equality using the two equal signs, the same way we test ints and doubles, but it doesn't do what you think. It's not going to produce the results that you want. So instead, if I call this dot equals method, now what I'm actually doing is I'm comparing the contents of the two strings. This is how you check for equality in Java. Most of what we work with going forward are going to be objects starting next week when we talk about how to design data using Java using Java's class system. Whenever you compare two objects to each other, you have to use this dot equals method or you will not get the right answer. I will talk about what the double equal method does when we use it on objects a little bit later. You guys will understand what the problem is. Um, but if you guys are working on some of the string-based homework problems or tomorrow's lab, keep this in mind. Oh, I wanted to do this one, but that's okay. Uh, we can come back and maybe do this on Friday when we review for the midterm. All right, um, one important announcement about this week's quiz. So we've been, some of you came into this class with some different ideas than ours about how to write Java code. We've been training you how to write code in the way that we have decided is correct, using check style. We've been doing that on the homework problems for the past two and a half weeks. Starting today on the quiz, if you submit code that doesn't pass the check style test, it is just totally wrong. It's not gonna, you're not gonna get partial credit anymore you have to meet the check style requirements. You get the same feedback you get on the homework, but it won't pass it. All right, I will see you guys on Wednesday. Enjoy tomorrow's lab.